And it is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my first uh, question this morning is to the Premier. You know, the Ford government has a disastrous history of not getting out in front of this virus. In April, the Solicitor General said, and I quote, we wanted to make sure that the modelling was actually showing up in our hospitals. And as we know, that's what walked us right into the third wave of COVID-19. Yesterday, the Science Table report says this, and I quote, there is a growing crisis in staffing for critical care patients with significant contribution from healthcare worker burnout. Speaker, Ontario has the lowest nurse per capita ratio in the entire country, the fewest number of nurses per person across Canada, right Question. here in Ontario. Will the government once again be waiting for cases to skyrocket before they take action to deal with the crisis in nursing in Ontario? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the Leader of the Official Opposition for the question. In fact, we are aware that there has been a significant impact on our health human resources as a result of the pandemic. They've been on the front lines for the past 21 months, and we're very grateful for all of the work that they've done. However, we do recognize that they need to be uh, assisted. We are making significant investments in increasing our nursing workforce. We're investing over $342 million beginning in 2021-22 to add over 5,000 new and upskilled registered nurses and registered practical nurses, as well as 8,000 personal support workers. In addition, Ontario is investing $57.6 million beginning in 22-23 to hire 225 nurse practitioners to the long-term care sector. We are also investing an additional $548.5 million over three years to expand home and community care. This funding would support up to 28,000 post-acute surgical patients and 21,000 patients with complex health conditions every year. So our government is fully aware of and making the investments that are necessary, both now and into the future, to add to our frontline health care workers in particular. Thank you very much. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, Health Quality Ontario reports that ER wait times are increasing. In fact, that they have almost doubled in the past 20 years. The Minister of Health talks a good game, Speaker, but when I talk to nurses, they're saying new nurses might be coming in the front door, but experienced nurses are walking out the back door. The Ontario Hospital Association's president and CEO, Anthony Dale, says this, and I quote, we're looking at a 20-year period where the needs of rural and northern communities with respect to hospital services have been more or less overlooked. Now the pandemic has revealed to all the system is extremely fragile everywhere. Things were bad under the Liberal Speaker. I would agree with the government to criticizes them, but they've become worse. Things have become worse under this Premier. Ontario desperately needs 20,000 nurses just to keep our existing system afloat. So my question is, why is this Question. Premier and this government doing nothing, literally nothing, to address this crisis? Minister Hall. I would say to the contrary, our government is taking action on every front to make sure that we have a strong health care system to get us through this pandemic and also to deal with the uh, number of people who had to have their surgeries or diagnostic procedures delayed as a result of COVID. So we are making investments to increase our nursing workforce, our personal support worker nurse, nursing force. We're also making sure that we have the capital investments necessary to be able to operate. We know that we need beds. We've added 3,100 more beds to the system. We have uh, increased our capacity for the workforce. We're also investing over $30 billion in the next 10 years to increase the number of hospitals we have. So we are constantly building, both in terms of the workforce and in terms of the capital investments, necessary across the entire province to make sure that if someone has health care needs, whether it's COVID or something Fine. else, they will be cared for, and we do have the facilities and services available for them. And the final supplementary. Well, Speaker, the health human resources uh, uh, capacity in this province is, is terrible, uh, and this government is not acting 
at all urgently to address that problem. In fact, it's not only that this government's not making things better, they're actually making things much worse. This Premier's low-wage policy, Build 124, has led to Ontario nurses feeling disrespected and abandoned by their government at a time when they have been working their backs off. They're leaving nursing in droves. All health care workers, Speaker, are burned out. They don't need a government to say that they're grateful. They need a raise, Speaker. All health care workers in this province have been suffering under this government's low-wage policy. Our ICUs are filling up, Speaker, as we, as we sit here in this legislature. Emergency Question. wait times are rising significantly, and the science table is calling it a crisis, and we're heading into a holiday season. Why is the Premier doing nothing to address this crisis? The President of the Treasury Board. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and our government will continue to invest uh, in our health care se uh, sector. As our public estimates uh, from last year showed, we made record-breaking investments in our health uh, in, to fight the pandemic, $19.1 billion uh, to support the pandemic uh, uh, recovery over the past year. And we reaffirmed that uh, commitment and many of those investments in our fall economic statement, Mr. Speaker. The province invested over 342 million dollars to add over 5,000 new and upskilled registered nurses and registered practical nurses, as well as an additional 8,000 personal support workers. Uh, this includes uh, providing 500 registered nurses with specialized acute care training. It includes adding 420 registered nurses through the existing community commitment program for nursing. Uh, it's adding 900 registered nurses and 700 registered practical nurses through the WE RPN bridging program. Response. Mr. Speaker, this government is saying yes to investing in our health care sector. It is saying yes to investing uh, to keep our frontline workers safe and to keep, continue working with our province to get through this pandemic. Thank you. The next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Speaker. My next question is also to the Premier. You know, the new science table predictions are extremely worrying. The province can and must act now to prevent another COVID wave. They need to finally reduce class sizes, Speaker, in our schools. They need to provide clear direction, clear direction to Ontarians about reducing our number of contacts, reducing the size of our gatherings. They should mandate vaccines for all health care and education workers in this province, and they should introduce free and accessible access, Order. widely available access to rapid tests. My question is, why hasn't the Premier rolled out free, wide, widely available rapid tests for Ontarians like other provinces and other jurisdictions worldwide have done? Mr. Hill. Speaker. Well, in fact, we have been rolling out rapid tests. We have received over Order. Uh, 58. Uh, Canada has deployed over 58 million rapid tests, of which Canada has received uh, 31 million and has deployed over 33 million because some of the tests were paid for also by the government of Ontario to be deployed in schools for students to be able to take home over, this, over the holidays. That is compared to the next closest province, with uh, Ontario at 33 million, Quebec at 5 million. So there's no question that these tests are being deployed across our schools, across our workplaces, in hospitals, in congregate care settings, in hospitals. We're making full use of these tests because we recognize that in as much as vaccines are the most important way that we can protect Ontarians, testing is also Response. extremely important, especially with the appearance now of the Omicron variant. Supplementary. The Minister of Health is missing the point. Ontarians should have free access to the rapid tests. That's what should be happening in this province. The science table uh, advice for widespread access to rapid tests was clear, and I quote from Dr. Uni, it makes sense from a scientific perspective to use rapid tests more frequently. For example, schools, 
in workplaces, in congregate settings, and to make rapid tests more available in this province. Over a year ago, in November of 2020, the Premier called rapid tests a game changer, and I've asked a page to come and provide that evidence over to the, uh, uh, the Minister of Health. Right now, Nicholson, there are more than Pembroke five million unused rapid tests sitting locked up in warehouses instead of being made freely available to Ontarians. Why won't the Premier do the right thing now and co commit to rolling out free rapid tests to all Ontarians? Minister of Health. Well, in fact, our government is doing the right thing by rolling out free rapid tests to all Ontarians who need them. People that are receiving them in the workplaces through our Chamber of Commerce, the children that are going to be receiving them in, in our schools, the people that come to our pharmacies in order to receive the test. These are free of charge to the people who need them, courtesy of the Government of Canada providing a number of the tests, but also the Government of Ontario paying for the tests for children. We also have expanded the places where people can receive those tests because we recognize that an assessment centre not, might not be the closest place for someone living in a rural or northern area. That's why we're bringing forward these tests free of charge to people at participating pharmacies. So there are a number of tests. There are no tests that are sitting in storage anywhere. We have deployed all of those tests. They are all being used, Bonds? and they are readily available and free to anyone who needs them. The final supplementary. The Minister of Health needs to study up on exactly what's happening with the rapid test. In fact, just yesterday, a pharmacist was relaying a story about a dad and his, his uh, son who uh, is living with autism who went to the pharmacy to get a rapid test because they both had uh, symptoms of colds, and lo and behold, the test was positive, and the pharmacist was very, very concerned because this dad was able to pay the 40 bucks that it cost him to get the test done. Lots of families won't be able to afford that. People need to take rapid tests so that they can go see their loved ones and feel safe. That's what's happening in other provinces. In other provinces, they use the rapid test at first signs of a cold, like the story I just told. We can make the, the holidays safer for folks by providing rapid tests. They are a tool that should be being used freely and have made available everywhere Question. so anyone can get one whenever and wherever they need it. Will the Premier finally do the right thing, change the game, and make rapid tests free and accessible to all Ontarians? Minister Health. Thank you, Speaker. And I would say, uh, through you, Speaker, to the uh, leader of the opposition opposite, that you cannot suggest that just because there was one situation that uh, occurred when someone went into a pharmacy with symptoms that they were not able to get Order. a test, that is not the way this system Order. is working. The only reason why people need to pay $40 for a test is if they're going to travel, and if that is happening, they, yes, they will have to pay $40. Otherwise, these these tests are free of charge to people who come in, symptomatic or asymptomatic in some situations Order. if they've been close to someone with COVID. But I can assure the members opposite and the people of Ontario that if they need to have a test, they can go to their pharmacies and they will receive a test free of charge. The House will come to order. Both sides of the House will come to order. The next question, the member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Paid sick days save lives. We know this. It's a fact because it allows workers to stay home when they're sick and not spread the COVID-19 virus. But a year into this pandemic, workers in Ontario had no paid sick days. And when the Premier was finally pushed to bring in paid sick days, they were temporary and they were not enough. But now we know that if those workers rightly so use their paid sick days to stay home when they were sick, to get vaccinated, to care for a loved one who is sick, they will be entering into 2022 with zero paid sick days, not a single paid sick day. That's not just wrong, it is cruel. So I'm going to ask the Premier again, will he do the right thing? Will he bring in permanent paid sick days so workers don't have to choose between going to work sick or paying the bills? The government house leader. 
I thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Again, I, I appreciate this question. The member will, of course, know that uh, uh, the minister uh, announced yesterday that uh, the uh, uh, paid sick day regime that we brought in, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, to supplement uh, uh, the federal program, a federal program, by the way, which was negotiated by our premier, which provided, uh, I believe, up to 20 sick days. Our program filled in some of those 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 gaps that were in the in the federal program to give uh, Ontarians the best uh, sick day regime. So that has been extended. Obviously, we have uh, uh, we're not through the, the pandemic uh, yet, Mr. Speaker, as much as we would all like to be, and that is why the minister has uh, highlighted the fact that we're extending these uh, paid uh, sick days uh, right through to July. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. We've seen the modelling. We know that in a matter of weeks, we could be seeing more than. 3,000 new COVID-19 cases a day. And we know the pressure that's going to place on our healthcare system. We need to act now, but instead of doing everything possible to fight this pandemic, the Premier is once again doing nothing. He is not listening to the science and he's not bringing in permanent paid sick days. So I'm going to ask the Premier one more time. Will he listen to the science? Will he help fight the COVID-19 pandemic by bringing in permanent paid sick days and help save lives. Again, Speaker, as, uh, as I've said, we are focused on uh, getting Ontarians through uh, the, 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 the pandemic, and that is why we have extended uh, sick days uh, right through uh, uh, to the end of the summer, because the member is right. We are not quite through this yet, Mr. Speaker, but, it, but as you know, the, the Premier negotiated a, uh, a na national leading uh, regime of sick days so that all of our essential workers uh, could be covered. Uh, uh, speaker. So, look, I'm very proud of the program that we have in place. We're going to continue to support uh, essential workers. We're seeing the results of the things that we have done to get Ontario through this, Mr. Speaker. It's not just about the increased testing. It's not just about the investments that the Minister of Health has made, but we're also seeing, because of these things, that our economy is starting to come back, Mr. Speaker. We've recovered all of the jobs that were lost during the pandemic and actually have more jobs, Mr. Speaker, with thousands more that need to be filled. And another piece of good news is the fact that the member for Brampton South and the members for Brampton West have delivered on a new hospital, new transit and transportation, a new medical school for the people of Brampton, Mr. Speaker. There is a lot of good news happening for the people of the province of Ontario, including so much for the people Response. of Brampton, Mr. Speaker. That might not have been the case always, but it is today, and we're very proud of that. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brantford Grant. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. As we know, the previous Liberal government sat on their hands for 15 years and did nothing to build up our province. As Ontario enters a period of economic recovery, we need a government willing to work hard to get shovels in the ground to create jobs and build the housing long-term care capacity, and the highway and transportation infrastructure that our province desperately needs. Speaker, after 15 long years of no, my constituents and so many others are eager to see critical local projects get off the ground instead of dragging on for years as they did before. Projects like affordable housing, health care facilities, and long-term care homes need to be moving at the pace that Ontarians need and deserve. Speaker, Question. through you, can the minister tell us how the government plans to meet these demands by fast-tracking much-needed local priority projects? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, I want to thank the member for Brantford Brant for that uh, that question. He's absolutely right. For 15 years, uh, the Liberal Party supported overwhelmingly by uh, New Democrats, uh, only ever said no to Ontarians. And, and today, uh, Speaker, under the leadership of Premier Ford, uh, our government is, is saying yes. Minister zoning orders, or MZOs, are a very important part of our policy toolkit to get critical projects moving at a pace that Ontarians need and, and that they deserve. Things like long-term care homes, transit-oriented communities. There are so many pro priority projects that our government is moving forward on. And when it comes to MZO, Speaker, municipalities, they're in the driver's seat. MZOs issued on non-provincially owned land have always come at the request of local municipalities. Here's an example, Speaker. Uh, in the middle of the pandemic, Mayor Tory requested an MZO to expand Sunnybrook Hospital. I was pleased to say yes. I'm proud of the partnerships that our government has with Ontario's 444 municipalities. We're going to continue to use the tools and the toolkit, like Minister Zoning Orders, to get these projects here, moving, here, Speaker. Here, 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 here. The supplementary question. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. Speaker, as the minister has said, projects that will support Ontario's economy, including much, building much-needed much, much needed transit and housing, are often slowed down by burdensome and duplicative red tape. Ontarians are sick and tired of hearing politicians say no to their priorities, which is why we are so fortunate to finally hear from a government that is saying yes. We need to be able to work in partnership with municipalities to say yes to critical projects like long-term care and supportive housing. And while I know this is not a new tool, Speaker, in fact, the MZO Authority has existed in the Planning Act since 1946. Wow. Ontarians deserve a government who puts people before politics and enables municipalities to better prepare for growth. So, Speaker, can the minister tell us how using MZOs in partnership with local municipalities are in the best interests of the people of Ontario? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, thanks, Speaker. And again, I want to thank uh, the member for Brantford Brant for his leadership. Speaker, the numbers uh, speak for themselves. We build, they don't. During ah, the previous uh, Liberal government, when they were in power, Speaker, they built only 611 long-term care beds. By using MZOs and MZOs alone, we've already fast-tracked 3,700. As well, Speaker, using MZOs, we've already been able to, Speaker, in, in just a short three and a half years, been able to fast-track 600 uh, supportive housing units in, in just that time. The previous government, in the time they were in office, uh, move, only moved 500 new supportive housing hey, units. Hey. You know, Speaker, the, the NDP also is not without blame. They stood idly by and supported the previous government over Pots. and over and over Pots. again, Pots. And, they, and they just didn't build. They just simply didn't build. You know, Speaker, it doesn't matter whether it was long-term care, affordable housing. I think I figured it out. I think the N. Thank you very much. Oh. Order. The next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. COVID-19 cases continue to rise in Windsor-Essex. Last week, the local hospital's EMS service provider and the Windsor-Essex County Health Unit released a statement reporting significant concerns of capacity pressures on our health care system. They report that our COVID-19 positivity rate is 8.3 per cent, while the province as a whole is at 3 per cent. To put that in perspective, we've had 131 new cases in the last 24 hours, four deaths, and 18 workplaces are in outbreaks. Nine schools and child care centres are currently in outbreak, with many classes and bus cohorts being dismissed. Our local health unit has made the difficult decision to impose further health measures to stop the spread of COVID-19, yet this government has remained silent. Speaker, my question is this. Why won't this government help stop the spread of COVID-19 by implementing the many calls from those of us on this side of the House and of health experts? Lower class sizes, improve ventilation in schools, <laughs> provide permanent paid sick days for workers, and mandate vaccines for health care and education workers. To respond, the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We have made a significant investment in air ventilation in all schools in Windsor and across Ontario, $600 million leading investment that has deployed 70,000 HEPI units into classrooms across Ontario. In fact, every single school that does not have mechanical ventilation has a HEPI unit within every single learning space. In addition, Speaker, we've announced the expansion of testing in partnership with the Deputy Premier, expanding take-home PCR tests to every publicly funded school and private school in the province of Ontario to help limit the spread. In addition, we've just expanded and providing in real time take home, uh, take home rapid antigen test kits, five per child, 11 million procured, $45 million invested to ensure a safe return in January. Mr. Speaker, in addition to that, we have ensured a very high level of school based vaccine clinics. We have, as a consequence of the partnership in education, where the highest Spons. vaccination rates of children in Canada. 20% of the youngest learners are already vaccinated. We know there's more to do, and we're going to do it in partnership to keep these schools safe and open in Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. If the Minister of Education thinks trying to open rickety old windows and making kids sit in classrooms in coats in the wintertime is proper ventilation, he should be listening Order. to the experts. <laughs> Speaker, the health partners of Windsor-Essex are sounding the alarms about bed capacities for surgeries at our local hospitals, many of which were cancelled during the pandemic. Constituents in my riding should not be waiting years for the health care they desperately need. 
We know that in order to slow down the spread, we must test, trace and isolate, yet this government is sitting on millions of rapid tests that could be made available to businesses, schools, workplaces and households across the province. When will this government take action for Windsor-Essex and provide free, accessible, rapid tests to every single person in Windsor and Essex County? Minister of Health. Our government is providing, providing free, accessible tests to everyone who needs them across the entire province. We have uh, ensured we have received, uh, as I indicated earlier, Order. Uh, over 31 million tests through the Government of Ontario. We've also purchased over 2 million tests to send home with children. These tests are, have been deployed across the province. They're not sitting in a warehouse. They are being used. They are available to people who need to receive them in assessment centres, in pharmacies, in primary care, in workplaces, in congregate settings, wherever they need them. Our, the situation is, is uh, unfolding as Dr. Moore had indicated earlier when he, we indicated our plan to reopen Ontario, that as the weather gets colder, more and more people are indoors, there will be more cases. We have provided for that and planned for that. We have sufficient capacity in our hospitals. We have but. today 154 people, I believe, in intensive care. Uh, including one person from Saskatchewan. So we have capacity in our hospitals, we have capacity in our intensive care units, we are doing rapid testing across the entire province. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, it's time to free the rats. And by that I mean the rapid antigen tests. Early in 2020, the Premier called these rapid antigen tests a real game-changer. And since then, millions of these tests have been on the sidelines, sitting on the bench with the Premier. Nova Scotia, UK, Germany, all sorts of countries around the world are providing free tests because they know that they're an important tool to protect people. An important tool. Yet this government has not done that. So, Speaker, the question is simple. As we head into a tough couple of months with case counts rising, why is this Premier denying families access to this important public health tool? To reply, the Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I think it's really important for me to advise the member opposite about what actually is happening in Ontario. Ontario is leading the country of Canada in rapid tests with over 33 million rapid tests deployed. 33 million. And that there is nothing sitting in storage. They are being deployed across the province. They're being deployed to assessment centres, to pharmacies, to primary care. They are being deployed and they are being used. We know that while vaccination remains the single most important way to protect people, testing is, of course, also very important. And that is why they are available free of charge to anyone who needs one. If they're symptomatic, of course, they'll receive one free of charge. If they're asymptomatic but they have been in contact with someone with COVID, and there's reason to suspect they may be infected, they will also receive a test free of charge. We have these tests rapidly available to anyone who needs them. They can take them home and bring them back, but we've expanded the location and we've expanded the number of tests that are available to people free of charge. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, at least this government is consistent, indecisive and slow to act, and rapid antigen tests aren't any different. The truth is that these tests aren't getting into the hands of families, and they should have been accessible in September when kids started school. It's December. Well, guess what? Families don't have them. The bottom line is it should be free for every family in this province, every person. They literally cost pennies, and we have millions of them gone unused. Yet the Premier is satisfied with families maybe having to go to Shoppers Drug Mart and pay 40 bucks. How's that fair? How's that fair in any way to families? These tests should be available to everyone for free. So, Speaker, through you, will the Premier commit to making rapid antigen tests free to everyone in this province so we can protect ourselves and each Question. other and make sure that this government distributes them widely and rapidly? Thank you. Minister of Health. Speaker, and in light of the um, 
comments made by the member opposite, which are not actually the case in the province of Ontario, I would like to indicate what is actually the case. The only time that a person needs to pay for a test in the province of Ontario at $40 is if they need it for travel purposes. That's the situation. If they go into a pharmacy and they need to receive a test, they are either uh, symptomatic or asymptomatic under certain circumstances, Order. they will receive the test. These tests are being widely deployed. Independent members sitting, come to order. They are not sitting in storage anywhere. They are being used across the province in a whole variety of settings, in schools, in workplaces, in congregate settings, in hospitals, in long-term care homes. We want to make sure that the people of Ontario are protected. The widely, the widely Official available opposition free come of charge tests are available to anyone who needs them. And I think it's really important that Response. we be clear with the people of Ontario about that. If you need a test, you will receive a test free of charge. The next question, the member for Niagara West. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Colleges and Universities. As you know, more post-secondary students had the opportunity to return to campus this fall, something I know they are very excited about. And in the months leading up to the fall semester, as students are hoped to be back on campus and look to our government to make critical investments, uh, we saw the Minister step forward to support post-secondary institutions and support the safe reopening of colleges and universities. Now, for most students, uh, September marked the first time in over a year that they were able to step back into a classroom on campus. Campus, and the first time they have been able to return to in-person learning. So, Speaker, as students approach exams and the semester comes to a close, they deserve to know what the government has done throughout the semester and what more is left to be done. So, through you, Speaker, my question to the Minister is what investments were made to ensure that students could have a safe fall semester? To respond, the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Niagara West for sharing my concerns for the safety of post-secondary students in Ontario. Our government invested an immediate $25 million to post-secondary institutions at the beginning of the pandemic to support their most pressing needs with the pandemic. This year, our government went even further by investing an additional $106.4 million and requiring that all schools have a vaccine policy before the school year to allow the safe return of students. With vaccination rates at 96% for faculty, staff and students across public colleges and universities, proving post-secondary is among the best sectors in Ontario for vaccinations. When faced with adversity, our sector faced their challenges head-on and were able to deliver the high-caliber education our students expect and deserve. Mr. Speaker, I am proud of the work and resilience of our sector over the past few months and want to thank all of our staff, faculty, and of course, our students Spons? for their hard work and to make our first semester back a great success. Thank you. Supplementary question. Minister's advocacy and continued hard work to ensure that students, as they return uh, to campus, are able to have a safe and supportive environment where they're able to learn uh, back in person. And it's wonderful to hear that students in Ontario had a successful semester. I know I've heard from many that they have, as well as a safe return to campus. But there's a new semester around the corner, and there's always more that needs to be done. Like many Ontarians, I'm confident that our students will continue to have access to in-person learning when they return to class in January, uh, but they deserve to, the surety of knowing that the proper safety measures will continue to be in place so that our students can stay safe and healthy. So, Speaker, could, uh, could the Minister please explain to this House what she is doing in order to ensure that students remain safe on campus and in the classroom this upcoming semester? Mr. Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member for that question. As this semester comes to an end, we look forward to the winter semester. We will continue to work closely with health experts and schools to keep schools open, keep students on campus, and to keep Ontario running. Mr. Speaker, Ontario's post-secondary institutions are critical to the province's economic recovery as significant contributors to the local economy and for the role they play in creating a skilled and qualified workforce. We owe it to our students to keep them on campus so that they can get the full post-secondary experience, filled with learning in the classroom, connecting with one another, and participating in extracurricular activities. Our institutions prove that they can reopen safely and that students can say, stay healthy. Institutions like St. Clair College, Western, U of T, and many others have acted swiftly when needed to keep students safe. I'd like to take this opportunity to wish students across the province, including my own daughters in post-secondary, the best of luck on their exams and to have a restful holiday season before returning to campus in January. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Pontdale High Park. 
Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. On Monday, the Minister of Housing announced members of Ontario's new Housing Affordability Task Force. <clears throat> The task force consists of bankers, developers, most of whom are PC party donors. Missing from the task force are housing advocates, co-op and not-for-profit not housing providers, municipal partners, representation from tenants and those experiencing homelessness. Why is the Premier ignoring the voices of those most affected by this issue while focusing on the voices of developers and donors? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. You know, you know, Speaker, again, uh, from the party opposite that says no to nope. building housing, says no to nope. uh, renewing community housing, says no to protecting nope. tenants, uh, that party opposite says no to nope. almost every policy measure. So last week they said don't even appoint a task force. They yeah. said no to that. that now the member's nope. questioning uh, the members of the task force. You know, the member also. Uh, forgets to talk about New Democrat donations or Liberal donations or Green Party donations. Oh. They, they, they forget to say those things Order. every single time. But they're great at saying no, Speaker. Uh, speaker, we've made it very clear, crystal clear to Ontarians we want to work with everyone on the opposition. Come to order. Crisis. We've made it very clear that we are going to be engaging with big city mayors next week uh, here in in the city. Response. We're also going to be sitting with uh, rural Ontario mayors at the Roma conference. Roma. We've said over and over again the housing affordability crisis is something that all Ontarians need to work on collaboratively. There's one. Thank you. The supplementary question. Back to the minister. The Housing Affordability Task Force mandate does not include issues like speculation, the impact of money laundering, or the commodification of housing. It does not mention protection for tenants against illegal evictions or rent gouging. There is also no mention of protecting farmland from unsustainable sprawl or ensuring land use planning aligns efficiently with transit, infrastructure planning, and investment. Again. Why does this government care more about delivering profit for developers and real estate speculators than about making housing affordable? Why does this party opposite no to continue everything. to vote against measures for tenants, continue Jane. to vote against strengthening our community housing system? Our task force represents a range of experts in nonprofit housing, indigenous housing, Opposition real estate, order. home builders, financial markets, and economics. We are going to continue to sit down with our municipal partners who play a key role in the housing affordability crisis. We want to emerge from next week's mayor's meeting with a renewed sense of commitment that all levels of government can do better. Again, Speaker, the opposition continues to say no at every measure of our government trying to make housing more affordability. They are, are saying to Ontarians no they're not going to participate in the discussion. That's fine by us, Speaker. Next question, member for Guelph. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday's FAO report shows that the government's failure to reduce climate pollution will stick it to taxpayers. Six billion dollars this decade, and 116 billion dollars this century in extra cost to buildings alone due to climate-fueled extreme weather. Just look at what's happening in British Columbia, economic and infrastructure devastation. So today we're debating a mini budget that fails to invest in climate solutions and adaptation. Instead, the government is spending tens of billions of dollars on new highways that will cause more congestion, more pollution, and more flood risk. Speaker, will the Premier tell the people of Ontario why the government is not protecting taxpayers from the cost of the climate Question. disasters that are getting more costly each and every year. To respond for the government, the government house leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I completely disagree with the, the, the member opposite. Whilst I do appreciate his passion on the file, we're uh, focused on actually getting things done when it comes to the environment. Mr. Speaker, he talks about the highways that we're building, very important pieces of infrastructure to get the economy moving, get people moving, Mr. Speaker. That's the type of thing that helps us pay for the close to $30 billion in, in uh, subways that are being built. In, uh, in Toronto and in, into York Region, Mr. Speaker. That's the type of investment that helps us build two-way all-day GO trains uh, uh, to as far away as, as London, Mr. Speaker. It helps us pay for the eventual electrification 
of, uh, of the, the system, Mr. Speaker. So when you look at what we are doing, we are putting investments in place that will help us, yes, build the economy, because building the economy is important to having the resources that you need to tackle environmental uh, uh, problems across the province, Mr. Speaker, and that's exactly Spons. what we're doing. The supplementary question. Speaker, let's be straight with the people of Ontario. Two years ago, in December of 2019, the Auditor General put forward a scathing report on the government's so-called climate plan. The minister at the time said, we have, and I quote, we have an evolving plan. <laughs> and he promised to make uh, updates to the plan in response to the Auditor General. So now we are two years later in another scathing Auditor General's report and still no updated plan to meet the government's weak pollution targets. The government's actually making things worse, ramping up gas plants that will increase climate pollution by 300 percent, building Highway 413, which will increase climate pollution by 17.4 million megatons. Speaker, we have to be honest with the people of Ontario about the costs and Question. risks we face. So will the Premier tell Ontarians when he will put forward an evolved climate plan that follows science, answers the Auditor General's criticism, and shows Ontarians how we can cut climate pollution in half by 2030? Government House Leader. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, it is a very multifaceted uh, approach that we're taking. Not only are we building transit and transportation because we know how important it is, not only are we investing in roads so that people uh, can get around and we can build our economy, but it was a progressive conservative government started under Robarts continued under Bill Davis, that continued under Harris, continued under Eves, that invested in nuclear technology, the can-do reactor, Mr. Speaker. And when you look at our competitors around the world, the primary source of their GH, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions, Mr. Speaker, is dirty energy. Ontario leads the way thanks to progressive conservative government. And just last week, the Minister of Energy announced the next version, the small modular reactors, Mr. Speaker, which will ensure Ontario access to clean energy. And not only are we going to save that technology for the people of the province of Ontario, Speaker, we are going to export that technology around the world because Ontario Response. can do that and Ontario can play a role in cleaning up other people's environment like we have done right now. Next question, member for Halliburton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Minister, I have met with constituents in my riding and have received many letters and emails from families whose children have been impacted by eating disorders. Just this past summer, we learned that children and youth aged 12 to 18 have been impacted the most by eating disorders during this pandemic. Speaker, we know that this pandemic has had a significant impact on our children and youth but especially on their mental health. I know this is something that our government and the minister have been very concerned about. So, minister, could you please explain to the members of this legislature how our government is addressing the ongoing issues around eating disorders in this province? The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock, for that ex excellent question. Mr. Speaker, we know this pandemic has been especially challenging for our children, youth, and their families. Health care providers across Ontario have seen a surge in the need for eating disorder services and supports, and that's why I was so pleased to be in Ottawa at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario to announce that our government is investing $8.1 million this year to immediately address the increased demand for eating disorder services and provide specialized care for children and youth diagnosed with eating disorders. This new investment builds on an additional $11.1 million in annual funding for eating disorder services through our Roadmap to Wellness, helping to protect our progress by increasing access to mental health and eating disorder services and supports across the province. Mr. Speaker, our government Response. will continue working with our community partners to ensure our children and youth always have access to the supports and treatment they need. Sure. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, I want to thank the Minister for his response and his caring and compassion. 
I know my constituents will be pleased to hear that we have taken quick and decisive action to address the ongoing issues around eating disorders, and I'm sure all members of the Legislature will agree that children and youth across Ontario deserve access to the highest quality supports that tr and treatment that they need. However, we know that the long history of underfunding by previous governments has made it difficult to access specialized eating disorder services and supports for many families across Ontario. I know our government has made investments to support the mental health of our children and youth, and I know this has been one of our top priorities. So, Mr. Speaker, through you, could I ask the minister uh, who's supporting children, youth, and their families who are affected by eating disorders what we have done Question. to them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank uh, that mem the member for that follow-up question. Mr. Speaker, I have met with many families, including those with lived experience, who have been diagnosed with an eating disorder. I want to thank, first of all, the member from Toronto St. Paul's for first bringing this issue to my attention. And I also want to really thank two young ladies that came forward and spoke to me about the eating disorders that they themselves were living with during the pandemic and explained just what the situation was. And I can honestly say that it was moving to listen to them and to hear how difficult the situation was for them their families, the, the, the unknown issues that needed to be dealt with. Mr. Speaker, our investments are going to immediately expand access to specialized eating disorder services that are going to support individuals with complex needs and provide critical services that have been missing up to now across the Response. province, including filling service gaps in Northern Ontario and throughout the province. Mr. Speaker, every one young person struggling with the mental health or addiction challenge deserves to have the help that they need where and where they need it. And our government will fulfill that obligation and, and provide those services. Thank you very much. The next question, the member of St. Catherine. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. From the beginning of the pandemic, which hit Ontario in March 2020, small businesses across our province have been suffering. Last week, we learned from the Auditor General that this Conservative government failed to provide assistance through this program to eligible hard-hit businesses, while we had hundreds of millions of dollars flowing to, in to ineligible ones. Speaker, I brought this up before. You knew your program was failing. You knew the problems and let small businesses hang out to dry. Powerade generators in St. Catharines waited six months for a response from the grant team, only to be given five days to provide invoices or his file would be closed. Premier, some of 14,000 ineligible businesses received over $210 million from taxpayers. What do you say to the eligible businesses that were denied and lost in question. this failed program? Good question. Grant for Grant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's an honour to be able to rise on behalf of my uh, ministry and to answer uh, the good question from the member uh, opposite. Mr. Speaker, I, I want you to imagine with me that you are a small business owner. The pandemic hits and you're shut down. You're struggling to make ends meet. The government steps in with supports on your taxes, on your rent. We open up a small business support program and you apply. You get funding. You apply in good faith. If you listen carefully, Speaker, what you will hear from the member opposite is that those small business owners are being accused of fraud by the member opposite in order to, to keep their businesses going and that they are expecting them to pay that money back. That's shameful, Mr. Speaker, and we will not stand for that on this side of the House. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Powerade generators in St. Catharines don't need an imagination. They're facing what's going on, and you know it. Back to the Premier. The Auditor General report found that the Ontario Small Business Grant failed to assist the badly affected accommodations and food service industries. Niagara and St. Catharines is a tourism and hospitality community, accounts for one out of four, every four workers. We've built our main streets and our downtowns around these businesses. 
As the AG report noted, these sectors were hit the hardest when you did not give businesses sufficient notice around restrictions. Premier, you waited nine months to start a grant program. Then when you spent money, it was clear you didn't know where it was going. How are you going to fix this for businesses across Niagara and St. Catharines? Member for Brantford Branch, respond on behalf of the government. Thank you, Speaker. And to the member opposite, and actually to all small businesses in the province of Ontario, where were the NDP when we brought forward legislation to supply rent relief? Where were the opposition members when we helped on property taxes? Where were the opposition members when we brought forward the small business support grants? You know what, small business owners? They voted against those measures every single time in this House. So you know who's supporting small businesses in the province of Ontario. It's the members on this side of the House right here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Council come to order. The next question, the member for Orleans. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Mr. Speaker, nobody can argue that the cost of living in Ontario has skyrocketed since this government was elected. The cost of heating your home is up. The cost of electricity is up. The cost of food is up. The cost of gas is up. The cost of taking the bus or subway, Mr. Speaker, is up. And the cost of housing is up and up and up. With their mini-budget, the government had an opportunity to help middle-class families, Mr. Speaker, but alas, there was nothing. Now, Ontario Liberals have a different approach. We want to help middle-class families with direct supports, and that's why we've introduced or proposed a $300 incentive for winter tires, Mr. Speaker. So given that this government has absolutely no plan to help the middle class, will they join us in supporting middle-class families and making their roads safer by providing order. winter tires this come winter? To order. Government side, come to order. To respond on behalf of the government, the government house leader. That's the solution to the crisis. Uh, like, honestly, so you're a hard-working person in the province of Ontario, up every morning at 7 o'clock, taking the GO train, getting on one of our roads to go to work, and Stephen Del Duca, who has been out of this place, and the Liberal Party reduced to seven members, the best they got— no, we're laughing. The best they got is a $300 tax credit for your winter tires, Mr. Speaker. Now contrast that to what we're bringing forward: massive cuts for small businesses and taxes, Order. Mr. Speaker. Massive investments in health care, Mr. Speaker. Job creation that is through the roof, Mr. Speaker. But don't worry, Stephen Del Duca. Stop the clock. Minister of Energy will come to order. The member for Ottawa South will come to order. The member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. We can restart the clock. The government House Leader, head the floor. Yeah, I guess that's the best thing. So they brought up two policies, colleagues. You'll remember. Now, this is the second. The first one was they brought in a policy to help Response. make it easier to elect Liberals because they were reduced by the people of the province of Ontario. And their second big policy is a $300 tax credit. I think when Ontarians go to the polls and contrast the, the supplementary question. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. We know that they have no plan for middle-class families, and middle-class families know that the government has no plan uh, for middle-class families. We know the types of people they like to help, Mr. Speaker. Develop it was, of course, this government that gave a Made in Ontario COVID grant to a company that purchased off-the-shelf gadgets from China, Mr. Speaker. And when they got that grant, order. When the company got that grant, Mr. Speaker, their stock skyrocketed. And before anyone realized that no one wanted this gadget, the executives sold their stock and make millions. So those are the types of people that this government wants to help, Mr. Speaker. Middle-class families know that it's not them. Yeah. With the cost of daily life out of control, it's time that this government support middle-class families. That's why we've proposed helping middle-class families get green, to get into the electric vehicle market with an $8,000 incentive for, for electric vehicles. This government wants to flip-flop on a— Stop the clock. Stop the clock. The member will take a seat. The Minister of Education will come to order. The member for Mississauga Centre will come to order, and the member for Ottawa South will come to order. 
It's the second time for you, too. <laughs> Restart the clock. Government, can Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, look, the legacy of the Liberal, Liberal Party is, is very, very clear, Mr. Speaker. Skyrocketing hydro rates, the loss of 300,000 jobs. Businesses could not flee the province fast enough when the Liberals were in power, Mr. Speaker, on every single measure. And what do they have to show for it? They left us the most indebted government, not in Canada, but in the world, Mr. Speaker, that is the legacy of the Liberal government. Now, I can understand why the member opposite is bringing a winter tire tax credit in. He needs it in Ottawa. Why? Because he was in charge of a failed transit system that was over budget, late, and ultimately doesn't work. Stop the clock. The member for Orléans will come to order. The member for Glengarry Prescott Russell will come to order. The member for Ottawa South will come to order. And over here, the Minister of Energy will come to order. The Minister of Government and Consumer Services will come to order. We have six minutes and 27 seconds left. And I will move to warnings next especially for the ones who've been asked to come to order multiple times. Start the clock. The next question. The member for York Southwest. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last week, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association released an alarming report on young people incarcerated in the province. Juvenile detention centers were described as only human warehouses and where education is seen as luxury and not a necessity. As a youth opportunities critic, I recognize the value of providing educational access provincial-wide that includes youth in detention. Mr. Speaker, through you, why is this government not providing compulsory education to young people in custody? <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, listen, uh, one of the things that we started to do when we came into office, and it really touches on the question that I just answered from uh, the Liberal Party. We saw that they had made so little investments in so many areas across the province, and one of those investments, quite honestly, Speaker, was in our uh, incarceration system. Uh, uh, we had old, outdated jails that weren't able to provide the services that we need, which ultimately I think we would all agree that what we want to do there, justice has to be served, yes, but ultimately when people are released uh, from incarcer incarceration. We want them to become productive members of society. That is our goal. That's why we are making uh, these, uh, these investments that are so important, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, I hope the member will, will, will support some of those investments, and we're starting to see the results uh, in that, Speaker. And I think perhaps in the supplementary, uh, the Minister of uh, Mental Health and Addictions can also highlight some of the groundbreaking Response. investments that we are making there as well, Speaker. So I agree with the Honourable Member. I am saddened that the Liberals didn't make these important investments, but we're getting to a better province of Ontario despite their failures. Supplementary question. Well, that's from, 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 from worse to bad, bad to worse. My question back to, to Premier. School boards in Ontario are not obligated by law to provide education in youth detention centres and only do so on a voluntary partnership basis the report details this and mentions black youth treated as security threats to be managed. Uh, clearly, we need to implement the 19 recommendations of this report by the Canadian uh, Civil Li Li Liberties Association. Will the government take this report recommendations seriously and act, and will they expand this report to include the voices of indigenous young men and women and women youth in detention centres? Thank you. The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, our government recognizes how important it is for everyone to reach their full potential. 
uh, children and youth that are involved with the law uh, and in a situation where they need supports, where their families need supports. Uh, this is something that our government is committed to understanding and creating the supports around uh, these children and youth and around the families so that uh, children can be supported in their communities. We are recognizing the regional differences uh, of Indigenous communities and rural and remote communities, understanding how critical it is for us to be able to provide those services and create uh, an environment where these children and youth uh, can um, thrive and can get the supports that they need. So our government is committing to make, making sure that these children and youth uh, that need, need support, Bonds. whether it's through the justice system or through uh, um, a youth uh, um, detention centres, are able to get the supports that they need. Thank you. The next question, the member for York Centre. The Premier. Many Ontarians are horrified by yesterday's press conference of the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Karen Moore. Since summer 2020, the Premier has been telling us that vaccination is the best and sure way out of the pandemic. First it was 70%, then 80%. Now 90% of us are vaccinated. But yesterday, the Chief Medical Officer said that it may take a couple of years for COVID-19 to reach low endemic rates, and the health authorities are watching the strain in our ICUs. Speaker, when 90% of us are vaccinated, why is the Chief Medical Officer saying that it may take a couple of years when for the last 18 months, the Premier has been telling us that vaccination is a sure and best way out of the pandemic? And to respond, the government house leader. The, I want to thank the member for highlighting how successful our vaccination program has been in the province of Ontario. Uh, I, I do appreciate, uh, appreciate the support from the honourable member for what has been really a groundbreaking effort. Uh, uh, not only the government in ensuring the resources are there to get us to 50 to 60 to 70. I think today, Mr. Speaker, actually is the anniversary of when the first vaccine was delivered into the arm of somebody worldwide. That was in Great Britain, Mr. Speaker, if I'm not mistaken. And in in that time, in the time, uh, despite the fact that we were a little bit delayed in getting those vaccines, Ontario has not only caught up, but we have passed every other jurisdiction in the world to ensure that we lead not only Canada, but the world in vaccinations in, in, in people's arms, Mr. Speaker. I think that's a great testament to the people of the province of Ontario, Mr. Spons? Speaker. And I thank the Honourable Gentleman for highlighting that in his question. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I find it abhorrent that millions of Canadians may be home for Christmas, but only in their dreams, because they're not allowed on certain public transportation, and because of the hatred and division fostered by this government by pitting loved ones against one another. Everyone in this chamber should find it distasteful. Yesterday, Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe called for an end to stigmatizing the unvaccinated. Compare that to yesterday's press conference by the medical officer. Moore said that a basic means of protecting individuals is stopping the mixing of the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. Speaker, as a Canadian who chose to vaccinate, I condemn Dr. Moore's hateful and divisive language. My question to the Premier, does he support the stopping of the mixing of the vaccinated and the unvaccinated, or will he join me in the spirit of the holidays and distance himself from the hateful and divisive language of the Chief Medical Officer? Government House Leader. Of course, uh, uh, Speaker, the, the Chief Medical Officer has been uh, not only the current Chief Medical Officer, but uh, a constituent of mine, Dr. Williams, before that, uh, Mr. Speaker, has been instrumental in helping us develop the, uh, the plans that have seen Ontario lead the nation and really lead the world in making sure that we have vaccines in, in, uh, in people's arms. But uh, unlike the, the Honourable Gentleman uh, across the way, Mr. Speaker, we know that there is more to do to get us beyond this. Uh, if we want to continue to have uh, uh, robust economic recovery that we're seeing, we have to ensure that we can continue to fight uh, this COVID uh, pandemic. We're seeing worldwide in other jurisdictions, I know the Leader of the Opposition tried to compare us to Germany and, and, uh, and other parts of Europe, where they are facing massive, massive difficulties. We have things under control here in the province of Ontario. It's because of the hard work of Ontarians to get vaccinated, Mr. Speaker. We're at 90 per cent. Maybe we could strive to have even more, and I know the Honourable Gentleman will help us get to that, to that point, Mr. Speaker. That concludes our question period for this morning. We now have a deferred vote on the motion for a second reading of Bill 52, an act to enact the Stopping Illegal Handgun Smuggling Act 2021. The bells will now ring for 30 minutes, during which time members may cast their votes. I'll ask the clerks to please prepare the lines. <laughs>